go first because I found that cool slide with the populism and demagoguery thing on. So populism, I think we know what it is. And here's a definition from my favorite source, Wikipedia. A political doctrine that proposes that the common people are exploited by a privileged elite. Now, this is kind of a, it's a template. And populism shakes out in different ways in different places. And the way it shakes out, the way it develops, become, is a matter of the context. It's a matter of the economic, social, and political circumstances in which it develops. And a matter of how we read the stories of our culture, the stories that we tell to ourselves. So what I want to do is, first of all, I want to talk about oops, the myths we live by, the stories we tell that have shaped American populism in the 21st century, and uh, why some of us are populists, but some of us aren't. And that's a result of a big sort, to cite the title of a book, a big sort that happened in US population around that period, an economic, cultural, and political divide that opened up. And as a consequence of this, we find that quite a number of people who were traditionally Democrats, in particular the white working class, became first Reagan Republicans, and then the base of the Reagan Democrats, and then the base of the Republican Party. And this sort, I believe, and this alienation, this divide that opened up, was in part a consequence of the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s and 70s, at which time the left betrayed the working class. So that's my agenda. Now, first of all, the myths we live by, and I'll tell several stories. Uh, first, whoops. First story, first story. The United States holds up the world. We benefit the entire rest of the globe with foreign aid, with military and intelligence aid, and through our research, because our research benefits people throughout the world. Now, how you feel about this giving, how you feel about this will depend on how you consider yourself to be circumstanced. If you feel rich, if you feel secure, you're going to read it one way. But if you feel that you're living in a situation of scarcity, if you feel vulnerable, if you feel in danger, you're going to read it another way. You're going to think, this is self-sacrificial. We can't afford this largesse anymore. We can't afford it. Moreover, we're being manipulated. All these other countries are free riders taking advantage of it. So, response, we've been taken advantage of by every nation in the world, virtually. It's not going to happen anymore, okay? Now, let's step back for a moment and consider American largesse. Now, some of these things are hard to quantify. It's hard to determine how much we contribute to research because that's a global enterprise. Uh, as far as intelligence goes, that's something we don't know about. We're not supposed to know about that stuff, but some things are pretty easy to quantify. For example, foreign aid. So what percentage of GDP do we give to foreign aid? Any guesses? Six percent. Six percent? Any other possibilities? Two percent. Two percent? You probably know the answer. That's zero point one nine percent, right? Okay, zero point one nine. Now, look, I want you, if you did arithmetic in school, as I did, you have to be careful about those yeah. Those points, right? The decimal point says 19 cents on every hundred dollars. Now, most Americans, the average, think when they're asked to guess that it's about 26%. We did a lot better here, right? Americans also are relatively generous because they think we should be giving around 12%, but in fact, we give 0.19% for humanitarian foreign aid and development. When it comes to military aid, 4.5% of GDP, and we'll get back to this. When it comes to the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, that's 0 0.00011, okay? So people grossly under, overestimate American largesse, okay? Second story, big bad government. Government has grown bigly since the 1950s. <laughs> Government domestic spending goes primarily to bankroll politicians and bureaucrats. 
provide benefits for special interest groups and the poor with a capital T and a capital P. And of course, we all know, we all know that whatever government does can be done cheaper and better by businesses and charities. So next question, has government grown bigly? Answer, yes and no, yes and no. Okay, and of course, Trump wants to see to it that that growth is suppressed. Okay, figures. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's how I keep my logic students away. <laughs> yes and no. Yes. We've spent much more since 1952, and of course that's adjusted for inflation, right? You'll notice when things really went up during the Reagan years, you'll notice that things are flat during the last Democratic administration, but one way or the other, expenditures have grown. But as far as bureaucracy goes, no, because employment has stayed flat. We're about the same as we were in 1952. Now you might ask, how did that happen? How come we're spending so much more that there aren't more people working for the government? And the answer is because we've decided to outsource government services because everybody believes that government is bad and they believe that the private sector, nonprofits, and firms should be doing the job, contractors and charities and the like. So to cover our tracks at great expense, the government hires all these people, right, to cover their tracks. So the growth of contractors and the decline of the percentage of government work that's done by government employees, you can see it from 1990 to 2013. And my bet is, I couldn't get figures for earlier, was that contractors were much, much less significant earlier on. So that's why, yes and no, that's why expenditures have grown. Okay, next story. Danger, we feel that we are in danger. Crime has increased. We don't live in the safe world that we lived in if we lived then in the halcyon days of the 1950s. We are in danger. Cities are, inner cities are war zones. Immigrants are members of a violent criminal underclass, rapists, criminals. Muslims are terrorists, and so on, okay? This only applies, of course, to people of color and does not apply to Sadiq Khan. Because recall, <laughs> when Trump decided that Muslims would not be able to get into the United States, he made an exception for Sadiq Khan, the Muslim mayor of London, who did not want to take this exception. So the response to this is only tough talk, strong defenses, and the use of force can keep us safe. The American carnage stops here and now. No. What about crime? Are we safer? Are we less safe? Are we the same? How, is thing, how are things gone? Well, it turns out, I have a graph for this also, right? There was a high point, I can't use this laser thing on there. There was a high point around, you know, 1990, thereabouts, but it's been plunging ever since, right? Plunging. Now, Americans don't know that because they, have been, they were asked, uh, what do you think about the crime rate during the last decade? The last decade, excuse me. That's over there, right at that end of the chart. Well, the overwhelming majority thinks that it's increased. Right? So we believe that we're living, the great American myth, we're living in a situation of danger. We also believe that everything is corrupt. And I want to tell you that I come from Soprano country. When I watch The Sopranos, I can identify scenes from my childhood. So I know what corruption is like. Okay? <laughs> so the idea is, the assumption is that deal making and informal procedures are the way of the world. Government, bank rolls, corrupt, corrupt politicians, unions, finance, rich lawyers, all corrupt. But it's not corruption as such that people object to, it's the fact that they're not benefiting from it. So we look for deal making, bullying and corruption that will benefit us. The art of the deal. Okay, now as a matter of fact, once again, this is the strange time and space warp that most Americans seem to be in because they seem to think that they're living in the third world where things really are dangerous and corrupt. As a matter of fact, the U.S. is doing relatively well as things go, but Americans think they're living in Afghanistan. Okay? 
Next story, Anti-Intellectualism. And this is an old story. That's a wonderful book. Anti-Intellectualism in American Life traces our whole history. So what's this all about? Well, the assumption is that experts, establishment experts, are mendacious, ineffectual, and self-serving. That only mavericks and outsiders can be trusted. And this isn't just a view of the great unwashed. This is the kind of view that I find with in people around me, right? Mavericks and outsiders. And I cannot imagine why anybody would want to trust a maverick or an outsider or a non-expert, right? I do not want to go to a maverick dentist, right? <laughs> right? And that's where the that's where the excrement hits the fan when it comes to dentistry. Because now we're talking about something very verifiable. Okay? <laughs> Analysis and argumentation are just obfuscation, the great American public believes. Most problems, most problems have simple, commonplace solutions. Simple common sense and brute force and ignorance will do the job. Everything is really easy. Okay? <laughs> I will say no more. <laughs> okay, so these are the stories that we tell. And the way people have taken these stories depends on their circumstances. So if you are a member of that white working class whose jobs have been wiped out by mechanization, by technology, if you are a coal miner and you know the hacking in you and isn't available anymore, if you depend on smokestack industries, right, you feel vulnerable and your picture of the world is that we live in really tough times and cannot afford luxuries. And cannot afford is the theme. We can't afford programs that benefit others, foreign aid, income redistribution, or frills, right? Like the NEA, the NEH, uh, public broadcasting. We can't afford. We can't afford to sacrifice the present for the remote future. We cannot afford environmentalism. Environmentalism is a thrill. We got to have them coal mines. We got to have those smokestack industries, right? So, one of Trump's representatives notes, can we really continue to ask a coal miner in West Virginia or a single mom in Detroit to pay for these programs? The answer is no, right? We can ask them to pay for defense. Right, we're in danger, but we can't ask them to play, pay for the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, which uses 0.00012 of GDP. Back to that figure. <clears throat> and when we're in a situation, when we're vulnerable, when we're in a situation of danger, we can't afford to assume risk. We can't afford to experiment. We can't afford social experimentation or social, social change. These are risks we cannot afford. We need a big guy to take care of us, right? We need neo-patrimonialism. This is big man government. And this is the kind of government that prevailed in much of the world until fairly recently and still prevails in the global south in many countries. Big man government. And this is the scheme that prevails where formal institutions are ineffective and corrupt. The government isn't going to do anything for you. So you look to magnets and warlords to protect and subsidize you. And to show that they have the guts and that they have the money, that they have the bucks to protect and subsidize you. They show their power. They show their power to protect and provide by lavish, vulgar displays of wealth. Okay, and I'm thinking, I remember I was reading something about the Hellenistic monarchs of Egypt during the Hellenistic period, and Cleopatra and Anthony put on this great parade where they had floats, and one of them was a 30-foot statue of Dionysus pouring wine into the street, right? Where, while Cleopatra and Anthony distributed gold coins, lavish, vulgar displays of wealth, and big talk, bluster, and saber rattling. And of course, numerous wives and concubines. <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay, so now some people like that, some people don't like that, I don't like that, but we've sorted ourselves out. And this big sort occurred in the late 20th century, and it was a political sort, because this is the way things were in the 1976 presidential election, and this is the U.S. by county, because talking about red states and blue states is a little bit misleading because when you disaggregate things, it's a little bit more compelling. So you can see that most counties in 1976 were up for grabs. 
there was the remnants of the solid South. There was also the Democratic Solid South that used to be. There was also Georgia, and this was the Republican. This was the election of Jimmy Carter, so Georgia was his state, so that makes sense. But most counties were up for grabs. In 2004, things looked very different. You have solidly Republican counties, right, in the light gray. You have solidly Democratic counties in black. And if you looked at this closer to the current election, if you looked at that now, looking at what I saw as I was following the election, it would be even worse because New Jersey and Maryland and all those good places where I come from would be solidly democratic. We sorted ourselves out politically because we've sorted ourselves out geographically and socially. So consider the neighborhood where I grew up. And most people don't grow up in neighborhoods like this anymore, and I don't think most people have. I mean, there was Dr. Rocco and Dr. Goodall. Then there was Jules Krakauer, the cop. Kids, Ellen and Ina, the Gellers, a mafia family. Dad was in the clink for two years. Paula and Rossi were the kids. The Cosdens were related to the Gellers. Helen Cosden, nay, Helen Geller. So you kind of get the picture. TV repairman, Natoli, construction worker, also in the mob. Things are different now because we've sorted ourselves out. So when I go to visit my best friend in Austin, Texas, she lives in a neighborhood called Hyde Park. And there are all sorts of music places and hippie cafes where you can get muffins and lots of different microbrews. So if that's what you like, right? Right now, people are able to be mobile and they choose. If that's what you want, you live in Hyde Park. If, on the other hand, you want good freeway access and proximity to the nearest Applebee's, you will live <laughs> in Eastlake. Okay? So we've sorted ourselves out. Now, what a difference a half a century makes to summarize. What a difference. Then and now. Then, low income inequality. Now, high growing <coughs> income inequality. The only thing that's going around here is the Gini coefficient, right? Low geographical mobility then. High now for upper middle class people who can choose where they live. And I saw one statistic that within five years of graduation, the majority of college graduates are living at a distance from where they grew up. Because we can choose. And as a result of that, whereas in the past we had socially heterogeneous neighborhoods, now we have socially homogeneous neighborhoods like East Lake. In the past, we depended and trusted universal news sources like Walter Cronkite and Channel 7, the most trusted man in the United States. Now, we have customized boutique news sources in social media where we can stay inside our bubbles and we never have to meet anything else, anyone else or hear anything we don't want to hear. In the past, we had virtually universal male military service where people of different classes and races and circumstances could get together and get to know one another, but now we don't have that. And I really think that a draft or a national service thing would be a pretty good idea. Finally, right now, College is mandatory and a class marker for all upper middle class men and women. So that creates this great divide between the third of us who are elite, right, and the two thirds who are not, right? The huge divide. Now, that divide started happening, as I said, in the late 20th century. And the result was social and cultural alienation, and it was also a great political division. And the most striking feature of that was the fact that a traditionally democratic group, the white working class, became solidly Republican. That was a phenomenon of the last election. And why did that happen? Well, let's consider what happened during that period. During the 1960s and 70s, there was a triple witching hour that had a tremendous impact on the way we see ourselves, on American ethos in general. There were the long, hot summers of the 1960s that created that story of inner city carnage. Essentially, this was tribal warfare, right? Between the white working class opposing busing and blacks and everybody else in the mix. Long, hot summers. Secondly, there was, of course, the war in Vietnam. And this opened up a great chasm between patriotic working class Americans and draft dodging, demonstrating college students. And I should say, I went to college during what was called the Vietnam era. By the time I was there, it was, all, it was already a lottery, right? But I do not know a single person who was in the military. Not one. There was always some way of avoiding it. 
There were the Boeing Spurs on one heel or another, whichever one it was, right? Uh, people would go to shrinks and get classified as gay, which got you out, or as a variety of other things. Nobody I know when. And on the other hand, who went? Who got stuff going? It wasn't us, right? Finally, there was Watergate, right? The big event in American history that completely destroyed American space and government in 1950, in the 1950s, when people were asked to rank which institutions they trusted most. Government was way up there. After Watergate, government has been in the toilet ever since. I like government, by the way. I'm a big, you know, but I am, was not on the far right there. You know, I am a big government tax and spend yellow dog Democrat. <laughs> okay, but I'm an old Democrat. I live in the old left. Economic redistribution. The new left had a different agenda, and this is the left that arose when I was in college. And who benefited from this? What was the agenda? Well, first of all, anti-war, anti-military. Now, if you had loved ones who were in the military, you thought they should deserve some respect, right? And if the military was a good thing for you, and it's a good thing for people, particularly in peacetime, you get educated, right? You get your life together, right? But if you're rich, you don't need that. You can go to USD. <laughs> Secondly, and I think this was a big deal, Democrats, the left does not package its program in an attractive way. It packages a program of redistribution, not as fairness, but as compassion. Compassion for the disadvantaged, marginalized, and oppressed, rather than fairness for all. And you know, I don't think most people are tremendously compassionate. I'm pretty cynical. Most people are not going to go for compassion and nobody wants to be the recipient of compassion. We want fairness, and the program could have been packaged as a fairness program, but it wasn't. And secondly, there was a uh, left preoccupation with sexuality and lifestyle issues. Now, I think that the objection to this wasn't only, or really primarily, that it was a matter of different values between social liberals and social conservatives, but a lot of people Looking at this, people who felt that they were left out, that they were economically insecure, looked at this and thought, I was, I was about to say an expletive, poo, right? I can't get a job, I'm vulnerable. And this Democratic Party is fighting a war about bathrooms, right? These issues, these lifestyle issues, it's not a matter of a difference in values, it's a difference in priorities. And what matters is money. Finally, and not, not finally, anti-assimilationism, the diversity agenda, the idea, the change of view. Everybody, look, every society dislikes outsiders, but outsiders get in and things change, right? And the old story, the story when the U.S. received massive waves of immigration during the first part of the 20th century, the story was they will assimilate and should, they will become us. So there were programs of Americanization. And sure enough, those immigrants assimilated. They became us. But in the 1960s, a new story started getting told. It was a story of diversity. There were communities. Good diversity is a different thing. Well, a lot of people don't like that, and I'm one of them. Environmentalism, again, this was perceived as a frill. We can't afford it. We need jobs. Your elites can afford it because you aren't working in the mines, right? But that's what we do. Yeah, you can say, let's have nice scenery. We can't afford it. And then, finally, when it comes to the left, the Democratic Party is what I'm thinking of in particular, there's a decline of support for unions and for economic issues, and also real disrespect on the part of the left, disrespect, condescension, and dismissal of the white working class who Obama characterized as, quote, unquote, clinging to guns and religion. And when I heard that remark, it stung me. And I know, and it still stings me, and I know that Obama did not mean lefty, liberal, urban, coastal, Episcopalian college professors, but it still stung me. And I can imagine how stung I would have been if I were a member of the great deplorables, as characterized by Hillary Clinton. Now, what this results in, this disrespect, right, this lack of concern for economic issues and just plain disrespect is a pushback. The revenge of the deplorables. So you can get t-shirts, right? 
lots of t-shirts. And it's never too young to, you can never be too young to start. Oh my gosh. You know? oh my gosh. Deplorable in training, right? That's the pushback that we are facing right now. Now, as a consequence of this phenomena where you have the white working class, in particular the rural white working class, but white working class generally, dropping out of their traditional home in the Democratic Party, people have asked why. And one of the famous books, one of the first books asking why was Thomas Frank, What's the Matter with Kansas? Why, why do white working class Americans vote against their economic interests? <clears throat> why? Now, when I see a question like that being posed and getting all sorts of conjectures, it reminds me, sorry about this, Brian, I know you like him, it reminds me of a comment by Freud, this patronizing comment, what do women want? And I'm also reminded of the response by Kathy, why didn't he ask? Okay? And I think that if more pundits had asked and been prepared to listen, that the response would have been, the answer is pretty obvious. Because they believe with justification, because the white working class believes with justification that the liberal elite, that's you and me, the liberal elite despises them and believe with justification that the left does not support their economic interests. So. Sermon over, and after the other panelists have gone, we can all talk about where we go from here. Thank you. In any case, thank you very much. A lot of ideas. Now I think I should be saying all sorts of different things, but in any case, here I am. Um, this is the new politics series, right? I'm here to talk about the old politics, I suppose. <laughs> and a lot of the things that just came up um, the kind of fractures within society that a demagogue or a populist leader can exploit, um, I think are really interesting to me because I, I can see echoes in, in much older times. So I'm, today we talk about demagogues. The term, I think, it's fair to say, has a very negative connotation, you know? Rabble rouser or someone who appeals to kind of the lowest common denominator, often maybe with a kind of cynical agenda beneath it all, which is disruptive to the state. Um, that concept developed in the ancient world. And of course, the term demagogue is a Greek term. Uh, it simply means leader of the people. Um, it's a term which started out neutrally, um, much like the word tyrant from the Greek tyrannos, just meant a, sort of an absolute ruler. These terms started out in ancient Athens uh, as kind of just words to describe the way people did politics. In time, they became, for us especially, dangerous words. And I'm going to talk a little bit today about how, how that happened, or at least a couple moments in that evolution in the idea. Uh, so the context, of course, um, in which all this stuff really got started is, is Athens in the 5th and the 4th centuries BC. Uh, so that's the 400s and the 300s. I always, it always kind of makes my mind want to melt a little bit. Um, the Athenians, of course, were the first people who developed the extremely radical and kind of crazy idea of democracy, uh, democratia, people power. It's a government which, up until this point, had no real precedent. Most people in the ancient world were subjects of some sort of a ruler. Uh, but in Athens in particular, a system evolved over about 100 years or so, uh, which produced a society in which people were considered citizens and members of, I guess we would say, a commonwealth. The idea that the state is held as a shared possession by all the people who are eligible, who of course were not women, right, uh, or slaves, or foreigners resident in the city of Athens. Uh, it's not a perfect uh, franchise or a completely open one, but it's a much wider one than ever existed before. Um, of course, we look at, this is the speaker's platform in, uh, in Athens, where the Athenian assembly would meet. Number of eligible people who were considered citizens, uh, freeborn Athenian males, varied over time. Maybe 45,000 as kind of a good round number. And the power of the state rested in the hands of these people. We, of course, look back to ancient Athens and to the democratic ideals and techniques that developed there as kind of our, our ancestry in a way. I think we like to see a lot of our ideals reflected in the society, and in some senses they are. Um, but in other senses, of course, Athenian democracy was extremely different 
from what we think of, think of as democracy. For one thing, we don't have a democracy in this country, right? We have a republic. Um, in ancient Athens, uh, citizens of the assembly who met to decide the fate of their state and often of other states um, showed up in person. This was direct democracy. Uh, the Athenian assembly, which was the main legislative body of the, of the city in the 400s and the 300s BC, uh, it met once a month, roughly, uh, at this place. <clears throat> Minimum quorum for a meeting was 6,000 people. So now picture that in practice, right? Anyone ever serve on a committee in here? <laughs> picture that in practice, right? Without modern technology to amplify your voice. Um, think of the kind of characteristics that might privilege in certain speakers versus others. Um, the Athenian assembly was, was really the Athenian state. It had the power to legislate, to draft and pass laws, the assembly, the collection of a minimum of 6,000 men, had the power to declare war or to make peace, to elect officials or sometimes appoint randomly selected people to office. This is a form of government which is radical in its egalitarianism within the select group of citizens. Um, and in addition to meeting in a formal assembly and governing through debate, uh, in which anyone could speak if they wanted to hold the floor. Uh, the Athenians, kind of like us, love their law courts and their law suits as well. This is also a society in which anybody could sue, any citizen could sue another citizen, regardless of the office he might hold at a particular time. Anyone could be impeached in the middle of their term holding an office. And in an Athenian trial, which had a jury of around 500 people for any given trial, and which had to be resolved any case in <coughs> one day, <coughs> uh, the fate of anybody could be decided by sundown. So it's a very direct democracy in which power was thought to be vested in the people, right? in the demos, the people. Um, this I just like to talk about because it's fun, and I like to imagine it playing out in our own society. Um, this idea that the people should be sovereign in Athens had some, it played out in some interesting ways. Anybody know what these are? You're not allowed to answer. All right. They're broken pieces of pottery. Uh, I dropped the jug. Uh, they're called ostracon. Uh, <clears throat> each one's called an ostracon. Uh, the Athenians in their democracy developed uh, a system which uh, we call ostracism, in which once a year, at a meeting of the Athenian assembly, if a quorum of 6,000 people was met, and people attended, uh, you could scratch the name of someone in the city onto a broken piece of pottery, which for the Athenians functioned as kind of scrap paper. No other use. Uh, the person whose name came up the most in this yearly vote was exiled from the city of Athens for 10 years. Could not return on pain of death. <laughs> I know, imagine, imagine in our society, right? <laughs> imagine what the internet would do. <laughs> um, the idea here is that the people would be wise enough to decide if someone was a threat to the state, to their sovereignty. If a tyrant might be rising among them, they could put that person on ice for a while, basically. Uh, and after 10 years passed, when they returned to the city, their support would have diminished somewhat. Uh, so you see name, the names on here of some famous um, Athenian politicians, Themistocles in the lower left corner, Cimon uh, in the lower right. Uh, in fact, most of the most famous politicians of the Athenian democracy spend some time in the fridge, if you want, having been ostracized. Um, these institutions existed because the people were thought to be uh, wise. And the idea of democracy in Athens uh, was that, in theory, anybody could rise to power. <clears throat> uh, in practice, however, most often the Athenian assembly was dominated by the wealthy and the aristocratic. <clears throat> in part because these people had the pedigree, they had the connections uh, to gather popular support for their proposals. Many of them also were trained by expert teachers who teach you how to speak well and convince people um, or believe you, which is kind of what we do here at USD, in a way. Uh, most often, the assembly of ancient Athens was dominated uh, by aristocratic figures like Pericles, probably the most famous politician from uh, Athens at its height. Uh, this is a man of extremely high pedigree who 
became the preeminent politician in the Athenian democracy for decades. Pericles presided over Athens at its height. This is the guy who said, let's build the Parthenon. This is the guy who helped Athens acquire an empire. This is the guy who presided over the first uh, years of Athens' war with Sparta, the Peloponnesian War. And for much of the democracy's early history, it was men like Pericles who, really in practice, were the dominant force. <clears throat> Even though, in, I, in sort of the ideals of the system, it's power to all the people. Um, Pericles died, spoiler alert, Pericles died in 429 BC, early during the Peloponnesian War. And his death actually uh, created a sort of leadership vacuum in the Athenian assembly that led to the rise of the person that I think now most historians look at as the first demagogue to come out of this early democratic experiment. Um, this was a man called Cleon. <clears throat> um, there's no bust of Cleon. We don't know what he looked like, which I think was a, is not a coincidence, actually. Uh, he was not an aristocrat. He didn't come from one of Athens' ancient aristocratic families. Um, he was an average guy. He owned a tanning business, a leather tanning business. So he himself didn't do the work. He most likely had slaves do it. He was someone who kind of was further down on social scale, a working man. He had been, uh, for years, during Pericles' sort of preeminence, a critic of Pericles in the assembly. Um, he's described in our sources as loud, <laughs> brash, uh, given to sometimes shouting down his opponents in the assembly, which some consider to be unseemly, um, but also charismatic, gifted at garnering support, especially on, on, among people who were like him. <clears throat> Cleon critiqued, in particular, Athenian strategy early on in the Peloponnesian War against Sparta, which Pericles helped to craft. And after Pericles' death, Cleon kind of refashioned himself. He went from sort of an outside critic of the regime to a champion <coughs> of the democracy in the midst of a war and a dangerous threat to the state. Cleon becomes, in fact, the next force dominating the Athenian assembly. <clears throat> and he uh, quickly begins to build a power base by appealing to the common people. So for example, um, he convinces the assembly that everyone who's called up for jury duty, just like we are today, should receive uh, pay for it, should increase the amount of income they could get from this service to the state. <coughs> and it was popular with many members of, a, of the Athenian assembly because for poorer citizens, this was a reliable source of income. Jury duty every day, imagine it. Uh, Cleon emerges as a uh, strong critic of elites, like Pericles had been, of the upper classes, a strong <coughs> critic of the wealthy in Athens. Uh, he stokes resentment against Sparta, the outside enemy. And he stokes the theme in patriotism, if you want to think about it that way, in the struggle with, um, with their enemy. He emerges as a powerful leader in ancient Athens at the same time, too, that Athens' population has been swollen by essentially refugees from their own countryside. Farmers, artisans, craftspeople who had come to the city in the midst of a war to seek shelter and were now living <coughs> inside the walls of Athens, kind of swelling the numbers of people who were attending uh, the meetings of the democracy. Um, with this power base, <clears throat> he emerges as a strong populist leader uh, who, with a combination of promises to the people about the goods that they could get and <clears throat> threats, basically, about the danger that Sparta and others represented, emerges as a powerful leader in Athens. Cleon convinced the assembly to make some decisions which in the end proved to be not so great, to put it mildly. In 427 BC, <clears throat> he convinces the citizens of Athens to vote yes on a proposal to slaughter every male citizen uh, of the city called uh, the city called Mytilene, which had revolted against Athens. He says, we need to make an example of these people if our power is going to be secure, so what should we do? We should kill every single man in the city. The, the assembly votes yes on this proposal. Seems like a show of strength. They're convinced by his oratorical skills. 
The next day, you imagine sort of talking in the streets of Athens, perhaps at restaurants, people begin to regret their decision. There's an emergency session called again at the Athenian Assembly to revoke the decree, and they quickly send a messenger to try to put the brakes on this policy, a messenger that arrives only after a thousand men of Mytilene have been slaughtered in the center of the city. Two years later, um, Cleon convinces the Athenians that they should double the basically extortion payments that they were squeezing out of the allies in their, um, in their empire, regardless of the loyalty of those states. Uh, so whether you were rebellious, whether you were at our side all along, you're going to be paying double. And this had a kind of a predictable effect on the fortunes of those allies and on their feelings toward Athens. That same year, 425, Cleon convinces the good men of Athens um, to reject a peace overture from Sparta, <coughs> the enemy they had already been fighting with for a number of years. Uh, this incident comes after the Athenians win it's kind of a surprise victory over the Spartans in battle. Um, the Spartans send an emissary to the Athenian assembly asking for peace terms on terms which were highly favorable to the Athenians. Cleon, very much pulling on the ideas of kind of Athenian exceptionalism, says, look what we've done already against this foe that thinks they're so powerful. We should reject the peace treaty. We should reject this um, set of terms, because in the end, we'll win better battles against the Athenians. In the end, we will be able to extract more out of them. The assembly votes yes. They vote to reject Sparta's peace offering. The war goes on. Anybody know how the Peloponnesian War ended? Who won? Not Athens. <laughs> Not Athens, in the end. In the end, the war drags on for a number of more years. Tens of thousands of people die, and it costs Athens its empire, its prestige. Uh, Cleon's hold on the assembly um, remained strong <coughs> right up until his death. He himself was killed in battle in 422. But the episode made a strong impression on people who lived through it, who knew the man himself, and who had in a way, uh, been affected by his policies. Our sources for this first demagogue, and they use that term to describe him, um, our first sources are two men who lived through these events. The historian Thucydides on the left, who wrote the definitive history of the Peloponnesian War between Athens and Sparta, and the comic playwright Aristophanes, <clears throat> uh, who wrote a number of plays, one of which is being staged on campus here in a month, Lysistrata. Um, <clears throat> in particular, who wrote a play called The Knights, which sort of lampooned this figure as a way to try to diminish some of his authority. Both of these men had pretty nasty things to say about Cleon, uh, the demagogue, and it's in their writings about this Athenian politician that the roots of our concept of demagogue as a harmful force can be found. Thucydides talked about the way Cleon was a brash figure who appealed to the commons, who would shout down his opponents in the assembly. <clears throat> and he saw this as leading people in the wrong direction in, their, in the process of debating the best policy. Aristophanes uh, wrote a comedy called The Knights. Uh, in that comedy, there's an old bumbling man called Demos, people, who owns two slaves. <coughs> One of them called the leather worker, the tanner, who's an obvious stand-in for Cleon who flatters the old man, the people, lies to him, convinces the old man to give him privileges, and then abuses those privileges uh, <clears throat> to lord it over his other slaves. In the play, the Cleon character is ridiculed by the protagonist. Uh, he's vested in debate and eventually leaves looking like a fool. The moral of the play, of course, is that the demagogue is a dangerous force but one which could also be kind of undone if you can make him, if you can show that the emperor has no clothes. Um, <clears throat> interestingly enough, it's a play that has some currency these days. Here's a production uh, that was staged at Columbia <laughs> University in New York last fall. Uh, you can see Demos there on the left in Greek. Uh, <clears throat> Both of these men had reasons to dislike Cleon personally. Thucydides had ended up exiled from Athens. 
in part because Cleon whipped up the assembly uh, against him. Aristophanes had been officially censured, again at Cleon's urging, because he had made a play that was deemed to be sufficiently respectful of Athenian tradition. <clears throat> and he received an official censure. So both of them had a personal grudge, perhaps against this politician who had emerged in Athens and stirred up the common people. There's also, we should think about, maybe an element of classism here, too, in our <coughs> Both of these men came from pretty elite backgrounds. And you might imagine, to their eyes, a figure who built his, a figure who owned a tannery and built his support among common folk and was loud and didn't know how to follow the proper rules of decorum in debate might be seen as unattractive to their eyes. When we're thinking about ancient sources, any good historian would tell you, any source, you have to think about what might the authors bring to this depiction of the figure. But nevertheless, we end up from the testimony of these two individuals with the image of the demagogue as a danger and a threat. <clears throat> there he is. That's for you. Thanks. I know. <laughs> it's this idea that democracies have an inherent weakness because the people vested with the power also have the power to give uh, authority to those who can mislead them. That idea becomes sort of cemented into Greek political thought, and it starts with this figure of Cleon. Plato, of course, no fan of democracy, uh, <clears throat> was a firm believer that the people were not wise enough to put their faith in the best, and that uh, sometimes appealing to the lowest common denominator can end up um, as a disaster. Aristotle, uh, following Plato a generation or so later, had things like this to say in uh, politics and other writings. Um, demagogues are those who make decrees of the people override law and custom. The insolence and intemperance of demagogues is the cause of revolution in all democracies. Uh, even in an oligarchy, he said, the personal rivalry of oligarchs can lead them to play the demagogue and thus to uh, overthrow the state. So in Greek political thought, you can see increasingly settling on the idea that leading the people, the original meaning of the term, can be a very dangerous thing. <clears throat> this idea only becomes deeper cemented in the writings of sort of later day Greeks. People like Polybius and Plutarch, Greek men, but Greek men who lived under Roman rule centuries later, uh, in their writings, the term demagogue emerges almost exclusively as a slander. It's synonymous with rabble-rouser, or often has kind of an implication of sedition. <clears throat> and it's from this legacy that we get our concept, more than anything else, of the demagogue as a figure who appeals to people's hopes and fears at the same time, uh, speaks to their prejudices, even as he tells them that they are exceptional and thus can accomplish great things if they'll simply follow. Uh, <clears throat> this concept is pretty much the concept that we still have today when we think about a ruler um, or a politician who takes this kind of approach. Uh, the danger here, of course, is I think that it can obscure an important question, which maybe we'll talk about in the Q&A afterwards. In a sense, don't all politicians appeal to people for their support? Uh, the dichotomy that emerges from kind of the legacy of figures like Cleon is that you're either a statesman or you're a demagogue. You are a <coughs> rabble rouser if you appeal to the people too closely. But something to think about is, um, is there a line, I suppose, between populism and demagoguery that maybe can get obscured? by some of the oversimplifications of the legacy of people like Cleon. Um, I'm not sure, but maybe we could talk about where that might be. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that, rather than take up too much time and pass the baton, if you're fine with that. Oh, I love batons. I know, me too. <laughs> So hi, uh, I'm Tim McCarty, for those of you who don't know me. And um, as, the, uh, as the representative of the Department of Political Science and International Relations, I suspect that everyone expects me to talk about political science uh, or maybe political philosophy, as, as Professor Albrecht has outed me as an inveterate Platonist. Um, but uh, I'm not going to talk about any of that stuff. Uh, I'm going to talk about literature. 
because what's the Humanity Center for if not uh, to defy disciplinary conventions and strictures, right? Uh, so uh, I want to talk about literature in part because I, I'm convinced as a political scientist that in art uh, we find insights and ways of knowing that are often obscure uh, to even the most sensitive uh, political science analysis. And, and goodness knows political scientists and pundits failed us uh, to, uh, you know, in the, in the run-up to the current political landscape. So maybe uh, we ought to give the poets a chance. Uh, at least that's what I think. So um, especially in the case of something like demagoguery, I'm convinced that literature opens up uh, pathways for moral and psychological insights uh, that are difficult to come by almost any other way. And I think if we're dealing with truly great literature, which I'm hopefully going to be talking about today, uh, then it will likely push against our natural tendencies uh, to seek out easy answers, oversimplified analyses, uh, and self-gratifying explanations of complex phenomena that we're almost certainly not thinking hard enough about. Um, and for my money, a thing that we're not thinking hard enough about is the fact that populist demagoguery in general, and the Trump phenomenon in particular, uh, is much more deeply rooted in the nature of democracy and in the American character than I think we're likely to, to recognize. Now, this is, this is an idea you can glean, if you want, from, say, Plato's insight that the tyrant will emerge from the morass of disordered souls in a democratic society, from <clears throat> Machiavelli's descriptions of the myriad ways in which rulers uh, will manipulate the public in order to keep the people, quote, satisfied and stupefied, uh, and from Tocqueville's <coughs> insight that majoritarian democracies and egalitarian principles tend to inspire in citizens a kind of calm indifference towards the lives of others uh, that lays the groundwork for novel forms of despotism. I could talk about those guys literally all day, as my students will tell you. Um, but today I do want to make the case for literature and for one book in particular uh, as a source for wisdom in our troubled times. The book that I want to talk about um, is uh, it's by the novelist Robert Coover, uh, and it was published uh, under the title, A Political Fable. Uh, and I wrote the first part of my notes at a different spot in my notebook. All right. So I want to tell you a little bit about the story. It's a, it's a story that I suspect will be familiar to you. Uh, a charismatic outsider in a trademark red and white hat upends an otherwise lackluster presidential campaign securing his party's nomination with unpredictable antics and a refusal to conform to the unwritten rules of political decorum. Uh, drawing on his fame and sense of spectacle, he defies all conventional wisdom by amassing a huge popular following to which party elites acquiesce despite weird, dark undercurrents and tr of treacherous plans underlying the campaign and, frankly, his own potentially dangerous and pathological instability. As things progress, his advisors... Uh, clash over whether to try to get him to tone it down or to stick to his unfiltered and unpredictable style. Uh, all the while, both supporters and opponents project their deepest hopes and fears onto his inscrutable behavior with little regard for how well their projections actually fit what is in front of their eyes. Sound familiar? Uh, well, this book, A Political Fable, was written in 1968, uh, republished in, in 1981 under this title, and The Outsider Candidate uh, in question, in the red and white hat, was not our current uh, occupant of the Oval Office, but rather the cat in the hat himself. The original title of this book was The Cat in the Hat for President. Um, <coughs> it was changed for fear of a lawsuit when it was published in 1981. Um, now, Robert Coover is one of our greatest contemporary experimental novelists. Um, if you're a New Yorker reader at all, you've probably seen he writes these short, sort of fantastical stories. In The New Yorker, his most famous book, um, is probably either uh, The Origin of the Brunists or um, The Public Burning. Uh, you may have heard of either of those. But this book right here uh, is, is my personal favorite of his books. And uh, the story goes like this. It's told by a guy named Mr. Brown, uh, who you may remember from uh, Dr. Seuss books like Mr. Brown Can Moo, Can You? Uh, and uh, Mr. Brown is a political <coughs> operative for a nameless political party. Uh, he's sort of a, a Karl Rove type, if you will. Uh, very much in a, a cynic about politics. And he narrates the story of what happened at their political convention 
they were pretty sure they were going to lose. They didn't have any great candidates, and their opponent was a real formidable force. When all of a sudden, the cat in the hat shows up and throws everything into complete disarray. Now, Mr. Brown, being a sensible individual, says, I'm not so sure about this cat in the hat fellow. But everybody seems to go along. The people love him. Uh, you know, he's getting all the media attention. All of a sudden, there's excitement in the room, right? People are excited for his party for the first time. And he gets convinced eventually, okay. But along the way, he meets the sort of people that, that the cat has brought along with him, in particular a nasty looking fellow named Clark. Now, um, Clark, you may remember from your reading of One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish. Um, he comes right out of there. Uh, uh, and Clark is, is constantly talking about the Cat in the Hat's candidacy in this dark way, talking about, uh, at one point he asks Mr. Brown, what's more important, the survival of an accidental human horde or idea survival? He's talking about total revolution. He's talking about upending the political process. He's talking about transforming the way everything works in politics. All the while, the cat in the hat is literally just spewing nonsense, and nobody is really sure if the cat even understands that he's running for president. Um, <laughs> now, the cat has these, has these absolutely buffoonish uh, absolutely uh, buffoonish surrogates, uh, Joe and Ned, again, familiar figures from uh, the Dr. Seuss world, uh, who are constantly interpreting what the cat is doing for the public. They say things like, well, you see, when the cat sprays uh, pink ink in the cat in the hat comes back, that, that's the red menace that he's talking about, you see. And, and these various other ways in which they're constantly engaging in interpretation. His vice president, by the way, is a fellow named Sam, think I am. Uh, and uh, all of these folks are, you know, to a greater or lesser degree, either figures from within the party who have been brought along, or figures that the cat has found somewhere and brought into the party, transforming everything. Well, as things go in the story, uh, the, uh, the cat keeps getting wilder and wilder, and Mr. Brown keeps getting more and more worried. And then finally, the cat takes things too far. What the cat ends up doing, and by the way, it's full of fantastical, ridiculous things of the sort that you would expect the cat and the hat to do. Uh, the final straw is when the cat literally levitates, flips over, and spins the Pentagon. Uh, and as we all know, don't mess with the military-industrial complex. And uh, things go bad, and what ends up happening is they, they realize that one of two things will happen. Either they will, they will face a crushing defeat, or... At the moment the cat is elected, there will be a military coup. So Mr. Brown organizes a group of citizens uh, from across the political spectrum to meet as a mob and kill the cat. Well, they do something he doesn't quite expect, which is that they burn him at the stake and eat his flesh, leading to a wild collective hallucination that I'll be talking about in a little bit. Have I mentioned this story is not appropriate for children? Because it's definitely not. Um, and what's really extraordinary is that when this happens, it shocks the public. And, and Mr. Brown is able to put in place the candidates he had meant to bring in place all along, uh, this fellow named Boone, and these fellows named Boone and Riley. And uh, they become president, as, and the cat becomes a martyr. And, and they, they make a new national holiday, Cat in the Hat Day. It's October 31st. Uh, and basically, all this crazy cat stuff, everything that happens, is just reintegrated into the civic religion that is American politics. Um, and there's, there's a, a sense in the end, the, the, the book ends, uh, with, uh, him saying, uh, this is, uh, Mr. Brown saying, legend has it, it's he, which is to say Clark, who has the real cat's hat, and then inside it are 26 other cats. If you've read The Cat in the Hat Comes Back, you know exactly what this is all about. Uh, ready to be sprung on an unsuspecting world. Oh boy. And where will we go then, Sam? Where will we go? This is the story of, of the cat in the hat for president. Now, um, I'm convinced that there's deep insights in this novel um, for lots of reasons. One is uh, there's an eerie prescience, to be sure, right? It's, it's wild how prescient it seems to be. But I don't think that's exactly what's going on. I don't think it's exactly prescience. What I think it is is that Coover is not prescient so much as he is a true fabulist. If you think about what it means to make a fable. This is a truly great American political fable. Like any great fabulist, Coover captures enduring features of the human condition and uses playful tales to distill persistent features of that condition uh, in a way that makes these sometimes obscure mechanisms uh, clearly visible. And as a fable, uh, I think it works on at least two levels. The first way, and the simplest way, is that this is, this is a book about the power of celebrity and spectacle in democratic politics. Uh, the, the tendency for democracy to have a weakness 
for celebrity and a weakness for spectacle. Um, and this weakness plays into the tendency um, that any such democracy can be manipulated by both cynics and ideologues simultaneously. So whether you are like Mr. Brown, a cynic who's just looking to win, or whether you are an ideologue like Clark, who has a very specific idea of what you want to do, you can manipulate the public's desire to follow along a celebrity and to be wooed by spectacle. I think the fact that we have this story about Mr. Brown and Clark and that we have in the White House folks like, I don't know, Reince Priebus and Steve Bannon, it's just, it's irresistible, the, the, the connection between these things. Um, this, um, and, and I think this stuff is all great, and maybe you can sort of ask questions about it, but I think, I think that's a pretty straightforward idea. Nobody's surprised by the idea that cynics and ideologues can manipulate uh, our, our taste for celebrity and spectacle. What's really complex and interesting in this book is, is something that I think ties together a lot of what Professor Abrak and Professor Baber were talking about, specifically when uh, Dr. Baber talked about the, the stories we tell ourselves. I think Coover shows us something about what I would call politics as metafiction. Um, and, and what I think that means is that politics is, among other things, a process of collectively writing and interpreting shared civic fictions. Um, in other words, we've always been post-truth. Uh, democracies involve citizens and elites creating and responding to the fictions of politics. We engage the world via imaginative fictions and then encounter new phenomena in light of those fictions that we have created. And so democratic citizens are engaged in what you can call the metafictional project of what you call uh, uh, the creation of new meanings out of these unstable yet shared texts. That's what we're doing when we're doing politics. And so in the novel, this comes out, uh, Mr. Brown talks about that the key to any successful politician is ambiguity. The politician has to be ambiguous enough that you can read anything on them. That everything they say can be taken in one way or another. That you can read them say literally but not seriously, or seriously but not literally. And that this allows them to have flexibility in democratic politics. Everybody in the novel is constantly interpreting the cat. Um, but also in the novel, uh, the Seuss books exist. So one of the brilliant flourishes of this novel is that everybody in the novel has read The Cat in the Hat and The Cat in the Hat Come Back. So they're always thinking not only of the cat they're seeing, but also the cat that has been a part of their memory forever. And, and in other words, it's not just a metafictional novel, but it's a novel that depicts a truly metafictional world. And I think what Hoover is doing is pointing out that our political world is equally metafictional on the same level. Um, so I think a perfect example of this is Clinton and Trump, right? Clinton and Trump were, the sh were shared public texts long before they were presidential candidates. Uh, they were the most famous pe two people to ever run for president in the United States. Um, and, and think about, when you think about what we do in a political campaign, right? We focus on narratives. Um, think about the truism that a gaffe will only hurt if it reinforces an existing perceived weakness or damaging narrative. So for example, people thought Dan Quayle was dumb. And because people thought Dan Quayle was dumb, one time he, he said potato was spelled with an E at the end, and it was a huge deal, right? Barack Obama once said during the campaign that he had visited 57 states. <laughs> no one remembers this, because Barack Obama's reputation is not as a dummy, but as a sort of out-of-touch egghead. So he says something dumb and they go, ah, oh, he misspoke, right? Because how we interpret phenomenon has to do with the shared texts that we've already uh, internalized. Um, we want phenomena to cohere into a patterned narrative that encompasses our experiences, beliefs, and desires, and so we project onto a candidate. Not just make America great again, but <coughs> hope and change, right? This is what, this is what we did with, with Obama. I, would, I am particularly fascinated with what I think is the head-spinning postmodern marvel that is voting on the basis of electability. When you vote for a candidate, which is to say you act in the world to bring about a result, and your explicit reason for doing so is your assumption that that result is already prefigured, that's wild. That's like something, I mean, that's like something out of DeLillo or Coover or Pynchon or something, right? Um, and, and I think that's what Robert Coover points out that we're doing, right? We do this, and this is how we convince ourselves 
to follow along to something so transparently insane as electing uh, a lunatic in a red and white hat to be president. Um, and of course, I'm only talking about the cat in the hat. Um, okay, so, so what I think is really extraordinary is that in this novel is that Coover ties in this storytelling to a much deeper story about America. Um, in the climax of the novel, uh, everything comes together. Uh, the cat in the hat is burned to the stake and eaten like you do. And uh, everyone has a collective hallucination. And if you, if you don't mind, I'd love to read for you uh, part of it. It is, um, it is a little bit, uh, for those of you uh, what not, it, it, is, it is a little vulgar at times, so just be, be forewarned. Here's what Mr. Brown says. No, I'd smoked pot, chewed peyote, and even with an FBI investigative team, tripped once on LSD. But the cat's meat was truly something else. For one thing, like the cat himself, the vision was all red, white, and blue, shot through with stars, bars, and silver bullets. The whole hoopla of American history stormed through our exploded minds. All the massacres, motherings, couplings, <coughs> connivings, all the baseball games, PTA meetings, bloodbaths, old movies, and piracies. We lived through gold digging, witch burning, lumberjacking, tax collecting, and barn raising. Presidents and prophets fought for rostrums by the dozens. We saw everything. From George Washington reading graffiti while straining over a constipated shit in Middlebrook, New Jersey, to Teddy Roosevelt wailing his kids, from Johnson and Kennedy shooting it out on a dry, dusty street in a deserted cow town, to Ben Franklin getting struck by lightning while jacking off on a rooftop in Paris. It was all there, and I can't be begin to tell it all. The flag-waving, rip-staving, truck-driving, gun-toting, ram-squaddled, ring-rail, ring-tail-roaring, bronc-breaking, A-bombing, drag-racing, Christ-kissing, bootlegging, coffee-drinking, big fucking tail of it all. And through it all, I kept catching glimpses of the cat in the hat running japs out of the sky over Hollywood, humping Br'er Rabbit's tar baby, giving Custer what for at Little Bighorn, pulling aces out of his sleeves in New Orleans. Now he was in a peruke signing the Declaration of Independence with a ballpoint pen, then in a sou'wester going down with the main, next leaping with a smirk and a daisy in his teeth out of the president's box, onto the stage in Ford's Theater, inventing the cotton gin, stoking Casey Jones' fires, lopping off heads at bargain out with Captain Kidd, boo-hooing with Sam Tilden, and teeing off with Bing Crosby. In other words. <laughs> The cat in the hat is, the, is that spirit of chaos and disorder that propels the worst of America along. Um, our metafictional democracy takes the vile and disgusting, the violent and the base, the bodily and the shameful, and it sanitizes and repackages them into the myths and rituals and ideals that constitute the civic religion we call America. And as I said, the cat in the hat is that spirit of chaos and disorder underneath it all. There has always been a cat. There will always be a cat. But it is essential to the American sense of self that we disavow any and all knowledge of the cat. The cat, like Trump, is something absolutely fundamental to our political culture. We have done this to ourselves. But when it happens again, we'll pretend we have no idea how it happened. That's all I got. So I think we have time for questions. I think so. Yes. Economics. I mean, that's what what all this all the changes we see in the world. Economics, besides what you you've touched upon. And, and to me, what, what we see going on right now is, and this is based on an article I read from the New York Times, it said, since the mid 70s to 2015, total US trade deficit goods and services over $10 trillion. And they estimated between 10 to 12 million jobs have been lost. These are real jobs. Another article actually put the figure at 17 million. Well, when you lose your job, you might lose your home, your kids may not be able to go to college. <coughs> I mean, this, is, this is real. And I believe what we're seeing today, Mr. Trump tapped into. That four decade, five decades, and all trivial to these trade deals that we made around the world that enabled this to happen. Your thoughts? Well, I mean, I don't, I don't think that any, any cause can predetermine the reaction to that cause. 
us. I mean, I, th I think that I think that I mean, unquestionably, there are economic factors, right, uh, Professor Baber? It's all economic, but it's not late. the trade; it's the technology that's replaced, for example, coal mining with you know open pit mines, right? The coal industry was going down long before any of these trade deals were made. A lot of this changed. Also, unemployment the went down considerably is, during the. Uh, don't include automation. Automation, you're right, is another issue. This was just. Trivial, directly attributable to these trade agreements. Somebody's making that ten trillion dollars of goods and okay. services. You're the social scientist. So, I just oh. do it for your No, but I, I think the I, automation is one that matter, and that's that's. I, I don't think that there's, there's no reason to, to reject that as a serious problem. But I think the thing that I would that I would suggest, and the thing that I that I'm compelled by, in and I think both what um, what all of us have been saying is that there is a you know there's a there's a problem, but the the fact of a problem does not uh, determine how people are going to respond to it, right? So so. Certainly, people are distressed about economic features, but that doesn't explain to us why it was into the arms of, of say, demagogic populism that they fled. Like you have to, we have to, we can say economics, but we have to understand the the mechanisms of demagoguery as they sort of developed historically, as they developed in the particular, um, you know, case of of the American case, and also I think in the um, the more general sort of political psychology of demagoguery to really understand. I, I, it seems. To say it's just it's economic seems seems like an oversimplification to me. He told him he's going to bring the jobs back. Sure. That's what they want. That's what it's sure, about. and 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 but people have said that a, a lot of people have said they will bring jobs back. A lot of people have promised economic nice uh, solutions. Point. Yeah, but I <laughs> no, mean, that's that's not at all true. Look, I think it's all economics too, right? But what we want is not more jobs and more work. We want less jobs and less work and more supportive services so that people don't have to sweat all the time. They don't have to do those lousy jobs in coal mines. We want education so that people can be trained for more desirable jobs that actually have a future and for the entire program that people on my side are promoting, right, which would ultimately lead to better economic situations for everybody. But I think we should probably stop there because yeah. we've done it to death. No, I think, uh, I, mean, I agree with them. Uh, it's the type of job. Hmm. I've been in the since 94. And as an engineer, uh, in the early 90s, I saw blue collar guy, you know, unit guys making over 100 grand in manufacturing. <coughs> when you do manufacturing jobs and you replace it by service, it goes for, to like 30 grand. The, the divorces have gone up, new marriages have come down, uh, drugs are epidemic. So it's just. We see that's because they're guy jobs, and guy jobs get paid because they're guy jobs, and that was not sustainable. Because now you have a lot of guys, right, who had nothing there more than muscle and guts, who could do jobs that can now be automated, and these guys refuse to work at those service sector jobs because they're women's jobs. But that's not the way. That's unstoppable, and if these guys want better jobs, they need to get trained to do the kinds of jobs that are now and in the future going to be available, because we no longer need brute strength and ignorance in the way that we used to. If I, if may I? May I interject? I think a lot of this is about, and I think your, your comments both kind of reflect on this, I think a lot of this is about the stories that we tell, too. Whether or not the numbers, however the numbers are sliced, right, I think what's important is the perception, and people want to have a sense of pride. People want to, I, I see this in Athens too. What did politicians like Cleon promise? Glory, greatness, a sense of place in the world, a sense of strength. What is Trump's motto? Make America great again. So if the perception is that something has been lost, and I agree with you, things have been lost, how does the demagogue, demagogic politician exploit that? It's by telling a story, a narrative about how we're gonna get back to that place. And I think that is the the thing that, more than anything else, enables a politician like this to rise to power, if that makes sense. There was a discussion at some point that some of the techniques of Trump in this case, but as any demagogue, was almost like the hypnotist using the same word, mm -hmm. using the same story, really coming back and back and back to the same story. Um, and it seemed that there was some cross in all your stories. So can you comment on that? 
style of how you get people engaged. Because a lot of it is not substantive, that's pretty clear. It really has to do as to how you get people connected. I'll just, I'll very quickly, and then I'll pass, pass it on. Um, I think it's about knowing the kind of words that will resonate with your audience. And in that sense, it's no different than any other kind of talking to a group of people. Um, when I see things about ancient demagogic figures, and there are others, of course, um, and I see sources talk about how they're brash and how they're loud and how they associate with kind of people who are sometimes considered undesirable. Um, I think you could turn that around and read that as being smart and knowing how to connect to people and to speak in a way that they perceive as genuine. Um, and then once you find that message, the sweet spot, you repeat that message and it begins to sink, sink in. That's my understanding of kind of what you're getting at, but I'm sure my colleagues have a take on this as well. I mean, I think you want to talk about repeating the same words. Like, I mean, <clears throat> Barack Obama's campaign was basically two really, really nice words, right? They were hope and change. And we, and we filled, we took all of our hopes and dreams and we put them in those words and there was a beautiful poster and we were like, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and then, you know, that you can, you can, I, I think that, that has something to do with the, yeah, I don't know anything about hypnotism. Um, so I don't, I, I mean, I, as a professor, I know how to make people sleepy. But, uh, uh, oh, right. Uh, but, but in terms of, I think, yeah, like keying into sort of, you know, words and, and that, that sort of thing. I think that it's, I think that's, I think that's rhetorical politicking um, more than anything else. At least that, that doesn't seem to me to be um, unique to Trump, but maybe I'm wrong. But you know, you look, talk I, Obama an orator and you tell Trump to talk. That's why I'm asking the difference between those two. Well, this room would probably use those words, no, but, but not a, but not a, not a, not a Tea Party meeting. Well, I think Trump was a demagogue too. I just couldn't stand him when he came up with hope, change, etc. I was, I'm of course I voted for him because I vote for policies, not people. But I have a maverick idea. I think what we need is not more rhetoric and slogans. What we need are facts and arguments. And if politicians had the basic respect for the people, enough respect to tell them the facts, they might get somewhere without this rubbish. So when I put up that figure about 0.19% of GDP for foreign aid, why did no politician mention that? Why didn't Hillary mention that? Why didn't Obama mention that? But we've become very, very cynical. And this was a result of the the interest in psychology and advertising that started after World War II, and it's become a truism that people don't listen to facts, don't understand arguments, you have to use rhetoric. I believe, give people the facts, tell them the figures, argue with them, and then the public will believe it and follow. I believe in logic. <laughs> I really, really believe in logic. Uh, I, I uh, completely understand. Um, I do mathematics in addition to political science, so I understand the, the appeal of having this sort of like clear-cut idea. However, isn't it a little simplistic to assume that if we just have these ob objective facts um, that people are going to come to these ideal, I think kind of idealistic conclusions about um, what should be done in society? I mean, we have like scientific figures about climate change, and yet people people who have access to those types of things, and we know for a fact have been, I don't use that, <laughs> who have been um, exposed to those kinds of things, like still don't believe in climate change. So isn't it, okay, I, but I some, you can divorce facts Some facts are complex, emotions. but a figure like 0 0.19, that's so easy to understand. And I remember seeing an old public service ad, it must have been from the 1950s, about where your dollar goes. These things can be made simple and vivid. So there's your silver dollar, and it's rolling down the street, it goes to the fire station, it goes to the police station, it creates roads, it creates all this good stuff. That was respecting people, making the facts available to them and comprehensible to them. And I don't see politicians doing that. Instead, they're shouting about change. They're manipulating. It's all using psychology. And that's what makes people distrustful because they know they've been advertised to. They know they've been manipulated. So I'm just proposing, I'm just proposing something completely different. I'm proposing facts, arguments, and logic. Haven't been tried in a while. So why don't people try it? Well, but I think look at look at the example you gave. Um, so I happen to disagree completely uh, with with okay. um, 
that I, that idea. This is my Confederate Platonism coming out. But the example you gave about where does your dollar go, right? This is this is a this seems like a like a uh, a neutral way of talking about uh, the federal budget, right? You think of your dollar going, right? But isn't isn't the emphasis of imagining imagining that the federal budget is your dollar? Doesn't that doesn't that bring with it all kinds of narratives of presuppositions about the relationship between the citizen and the state, the relationship between citizens and each other? This this is what this is what gives us a sort of consumerist model of politics. A sort of this is what gives us the fantasy. You talked about the simple solutions. This is the fantasy that plays out in the movie Dave, where he brings in his 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 personal accountant to balance the federal budget. Because of course it's it's your dollar. It just it's your household income. It's scaled upward, and that's how we should understand the federal budget. And that is full of all kinds of complex mendacity and, and, and deception that is baked into what seems like a simple narrative idea, but, but it, and, it, and it perpetuates these ways of thinking and these logics that get embedded into our, into our politics. So I think, I mean, I, I'll associate myself with what Kateri was saying, is that, is that you cannot separate what appears to be a fact from the sort of narrative context in which it gets. We can't even talk about government without metaphors. And, and, um, and I think those metaphors that we choose say a lot about, or they, they have material consequence in the world of politics that I think we, we have to be attentive to. And I think to be dismissive of, of rhetoric and of political psychology, I think misses all of that. I'm not denying that things that claims have to be packaged. I'm not claiming that they aren't packaged and that there are these metaphors surrounding them. But there's got to be some substance. And when I heard Obama, hope, change, change, hope, right? And when I hear Trump, make America great again, we got There's no content there at all. So certainly <laughs> the content is packaged. I mean, Trump. But there are no figures, right? Oh, but there's, but there's. So for example, I mean, you could. You would defy anyone to lay out, say, three policies that Hillary Clinton could be sure to enact on day one of her administration, right? Hillary Clinton had Hillary Clinton was all about substance, but but in terms of but you ask a you ask a Trump voter, he's gonna build a wall, he's gonna ban Muslims, he's gonna he's gonna get rid of Obamacare, he's gonna rip up NAFTA. And he didn't, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't. Well sure, okay. but that's but that's Hillary substance. Have, that's substance. You, have, you, you well, can't deny the substance. Hillary could have explained explain. things in a simple and clear way. Like take that figure which I love point zero 0 0.19, you know, you can make that comprehensible by pe to people, just as I did by saying, hey, you got $100 because you worked for a week at the Logic Center, 19 cents, not enough for a latte, not even enough for a cheap big pen, right? You can make those facts vivid like the rolling dollar. So I'm not saying that there isn't packaging. I'm saying we need a little more content around here. Sure, you can make them vivid, and then what you suggest to them is, like anyone, like anyone says, so, so you're saying that my 19 cents doesn't matter. Well, you've clearly never had to, uh, you clearly never had to balance a household budget. You've never, you don't, you don't know what it means for 19 cents to matter. 19 cents matters if you're really struggling. If you're economically depressed, you tell me not to care about my 19 cents. How dare you, right? You're a liberal elitist who doesn't care about what it means to, to balance a pocketbook. Sounds fanciful to me. 19 cents out of $100. Remember, it's out of $100. Hey, I've got some money here. I'll give people a quarter. You don't even have to give me the change. You want a quarter? Right? Anybody that's, want a quarter? That's great. I'm just saying. I'm just right. saying that these that these arguments have costs and these arguments are contextual. Okay, here we go. Anybody want a quarter? <laughs> there you go. Keep the change. Keep the change. That's great. If we have if we have politicians throwing money uh, at at, uh, at, yes. at yes. audiences, Anthony and Cleopatra did it on those excessive displays of wealth. Yep. And that asked. seems like a very crowd pleasing tactic, which uh, does not quarters. necessarily lend itself to. Logical oh, but I was making a point about ah, the percentage. Yes. The percentage. Mm. I was making it vivid. I, I vivid. wish that I was sweet, making it vivid. Sweet, pure reason for how we. Well, you know, it hasn't been tried for quite a while, has it? Okay, it has not been tried. Uh, the voice of sweet, pure, pure reason. Five thirty. I promised the audience stop, so we can continue if you wish to over cookies and coffee. But in the meantime, just people who need to leave. I would just like to thank the three of you for that very, very